Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Alexander. My name is Jim O'Hara. I'm the Director of Health Promotion Policy for the Center for Science and the Public Interest. We are a public interest science-based advocacy organization that works to improve nutrition policies in our communities and at the federal level as well. We led the charge to remove trans fat from the food supply. We have nearly 2,000 members in the District of Columbia, and we are honored to work with the Ward 7 Health Alliance in its efforts to reduce health disparities, especially with regard to diabetes in Ward 7 and 8. Last year, if you rode a Metro bus or a, the Metro train, you likely saw ads proclaiming DC, the District of Cola. It was catchy, but it also said something significant and disturbing about the health of our community. Almost one in four high school students in the district reported drinking one or more soda in 2013. One in five said they drank two or more sodas, and one in 10 claimed to have drunk three or more sodas. Remember that a 12-ounce soda contains nine or 10 teaspoons of sugar. That is the amount recommended as the daily limit by the dietary guidelines for Americans. In short, when it comes to added sugar, many of our high school students are consuming as much or more as recommended each day in one soda. The health consequences of this soda consumption are clear. Increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and tooth decay for our children. That's what it means to be the District of COLA. Let's look at what it means through the lens of health equity. In 2012, in Ward 7 and 8, more than three times as many residents report drinking soda two or more times in the past week compared to residents in Ward 7. While the prevalence of diabetes in the district in 2014 was 8.4%, in Ward 7 it was 13.4%, and 19.7% in Ward 8. In 2013, the disparities in the district for obesity were striking. 33.7% for black residents, 24.9% for Hispanic residents, and 9.6% for white residents. Increased risk for health disparities in our community. That's what it means to be the District of COLA. We can continue to surrender our health independence to the soda company's marketing, or we can take steps to protect the health of our youth and all of our communities. You asked uh, Ms. Baldoff a minute ago what other communities are doing. Other cities such as New York have mounted hard-hitting and sustained public awareness campaigns. Other cities such as Boston and Seattle have launched community-wide initiatives by their flagship healthcare institutions to promote healthy beverage policy. Other cities, such as Baltimore and San Francisco, are seeking policies to warn about the health risks of excessive sugar drink consumption. It's time to take a step in the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you to the chairperson and the committee for the opportunity to testify this, this afternoon. My name is Angela Amico, and I am a project coordinator and the Mark and Sushma Palmer Public Health Advocacy Fellow at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. I am proud to speak here today with the Health Alliance Network, which plays a critical role elevating the voices of Ward 7 residents to ensure health, equity, and opportunity for everyone in the District of Columbia. Nearly a quarter of adults in D.C. consume soda or another sweetened beverage at least once a day. As you heard from my colleague Jim, community institutions, including universities, hospitals, and government properties, can play critical roles promoting healthier beverage options and choices. Last year, the University of California, San Francisco, announced that it would phase out sugar drinks on its campus, selling only zero-calorie or non-sweetened drinks. The university recognized its unique position as a leader in health and pledged to to create a healthy beverage environment for both its employees and its students. The district is home to several leading universities and colleges that could take a similarly bold step. 
Across the country, health systems and hospitals have taken action to model a culture of health and reduce sugar drink consumption by their employees, their patients, and their visitors. These efforts have come in different forms, allowing hospitals to phase in changes, respect the unique culture of individual institutions, and gain support throughout their organizations. For instance, health systems in Seattle, King County, Washington, took a stepwise approach using Healthcare Without Harm's Healthy Food and Healthcare Pledge to gradually create a better food and beverage environment. The Boston Public Health Commission engaged 10 medical centers in Boston to reduce sugar drink consumption. The hospitals employed a variety of strategies, including a Rethink Your Drink education campaign in which beverages were labeled with red, yellow, or green stickers to indicate their caloric content. Hospitals use choice architecture to influence consumer decisions by placing healthier beverages in more prominent locations and making high caloric drinks less, less accessible. Other leading hospitals have stopped selling sugar drinks entirely, expanding on earlier efforts to ban smoking and eliminate trans fats from their campuses. In 2010, the Cleveland Clinic eliminated the sale of sugar drinks and has since been followed by major health institutions. Here in Washington, D.C., Sibley Hospital, as part of Johns Hopkins Health System, has implemented policies around sugar drinks. The hospital's first distributed educational materials then offered only water and diet fountain drinks in the cafeteria and limited sugar drinks in vending machines. Finally, a critical institution in any community is the government itself. The city of San Francisco banned sugar drinks from vending machines on its property. The District of Columbia has adopted nutrition standards for products sold in vending machines, including sugar drinks. The power of community institutions in the District of Columbia to address sugar drinks is critical as we face disproportionate rates of preventable chronic diseases. Good health should not be limited to only some of the district's residents, and it is important for our community institutions to model a culture of health. It is now more important than ever that we position ourselves not as the District of Cola, but as a District of Health. Thank you. I thank you for your testimony. I haven't seen that ad, District of Cola. <laughs> I need to look around more. Thank you.